pregnant with promise. Um, it's not often that you actually get to embody the message that you're giving. And so this is a rare, a rare opportunity, um, reaching 30 weeks in the third trimester, and we'll see how long I last up here. But thanks to Jean for the water. You're, you're always so sweet to attend to the details. Um, but really excited about this message this morning, and as I was asking the Lord specifically what to share around this, um, what, what was on my heart is that we might be encouraged in faith as we wait on God to bring his promises to pass in our lives. Um, and we're going to look this morning at two different examples. We're going to look at the Israelite story out of uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy, Grant read some of that for us. And then we're also going to look at Mary's story of both men and women who had been given promises by God. They had been pregnant with promise. And when I use that term, I, I mean before the moment that they see God do anything, when God speaks a word into our life, whether directly through his word, whether through somebody else, um, or, or whether through the Holy Spirit, it's that moment of conception where the promise starts to take root, but it can be a long time between, between conception of that promise and when God brings that to pass. The Israelites know this full well. They were on a long journey. Um, the two main events, as we know, in the Old Testament that shaped identity for the Israelites were the exodus and the exile. The exodus, this journey of promise towards what God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the exile, when they then get removed from their homeland and the prophets speak about God bringing them back and restoring them. And so what, so hopefully this visual helps, but it is that moment when God speaks a word and then that delay time. And in pregnancy, we know how long that, that period is, right, in the natural. It's usually 39 to 40 weeks is considered uh, a full-term baby. But for many of us, we come in this morning carrying in our hearts promises that God has said, and we have no idea how long it's going to take for him to bring them to pass. And so that in-between time, I believe, is the time where it's most easy to grow weary and to lose heart and to get tempted to take shortcuts, to think we have to bring about the promise in our own strength and to miss out on what God's doing. Um, in, in my own life, uh, around Terry and I uh, having Katerina, the, the Pregnant with Promise actually started about two years ago. Um, Terry and I were married, and I had gotten up to speak at Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. I came back down, and a woman came up to Terry after a colleague of ours, and she said, um, I, had a, I had a vision of, of Caitlin being pregnant. She said, I had, a, I had a vision of her being pregnant, I think, with a baby girl. And she said, you have two boys, Terry, right? And he said, yes. She said, yeah, I believe that she's going to be pregnant with a girl. And I mean, she had no idea, right, of anything. And every time somebody shares a word from, that you believe is from the Lord, you hold it and you want to test it and you know it's true when it comes to pass, but you want to receive it in faith as well, right? And this is a woman who walked with the Lord, and so I stored that away, right, in, in my heart, and, um, and then uh, some time passed, we were having difficulty getting pregnant, and I was um, disappointed, you know, after you take some of those home pregnancy tests, and, it, and I wasn't, and just praying before the Lord and reading a devotional about how Abraham and Sarah, right, had become pregnant against all odds, Right? Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead. She was barren. There was no sign of any possibility that she could conceive a child. And, and I was struck by this phrase, um, at just the right time, says in Genesis. At just the right time, God brought forward his promise. He fulfilled his promise to her. And I remember the Holy Spirit kind of nudging me like, Kate, at just the right time, at just the right time, you know? And I was open to, does that mean adoption? Are we going to have a baby girl that way? Or, you know, you just hold it before the Lord. But I knew that God was saying, hey, when I speak, I'm intimately involved in your life. Like, this is not an area that is unseen to me. And then fast forward um, some months later, uh, I have permission to share this story, but we're in a small group, an emotional freedom small group, and we spend time praying for each other. And Ann Plankovich 
had a very strong sense where we're talking about something totally unrelated. She says, Caitlin, this is really awkward for me to bring up. And it, took, it takes risk, right, when you feel like God is putting something on your heart to actually share something with someone else. It takes great risk. And, and she said, I, I think we're supposed to pray for you tonight. And we're supposed to pray, some of you were in the room, she said, we're supposed to pray around fertility. She's like, I, I mean, I, I can't leave this house until we do that. It's just so strong. And I don't want to misrepresent God, but I really think he wants to do something here. And she didn't even know that that was something Terry and I were praying around. So they prayed and laid hands. She said, I, I think there's going to be a baby shower for you. And that, show, that, that word uh, came about um, one year before Katerina's due date. So almost exactly to the date uh, of April 19th of last year was when Anne had that word from, from the Lord. And so, um, so, so our period was shorter, right? It was like a two-year period between when God started speaking and then um, when this, this little girl came to be. Um, but for many of us, the period is a lot longer, and we have no idea what that gestational period is going to look like. And that's where we can get sidetracked, I believe, all along the way. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 6. We're going to start off with the Israelites' journey. Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. So the Israelites have been in bondage in Egypt. They get there, of course, um, through Joseph and how God works through his impossible situation to raise him up in leadership and to... Um, to basically save the Israelites when there's famine in their own land. So now they've been in slavery for quite a while, and, and God promises that he's going to deliver them. So God uses Moses, and he says, Say to the Israelites, I'm the Lord, and I'll bring you out from the yoke of the Egyptians. Verse 6, I'll free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I'll be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of Egyptians. And I'll bring you to the land that I swore, the land I promised with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I'll give it to you as a possession. I'm the Lord. Right? So he's promising, hey, I'm going to bring you out. Your situation looks really dismal. But this is a promise that I've already made to your ancestors, so work with me here, right? But then we get to verse 9 in their response. Moses reports this to the Israelites. But they didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. They didn't listen to him because of their discouragement and cruel bondage. Does that sound familiar sometimes? Like God wants to speak something into our lives, but there's so much discouragement about not seeing him bring things to pass like we thought he would in the timetable or in the way that we thought he would, that it that the words just kind of fall off of us, right? They don't take, our hearts aren't good soil for them to actually take root. Because the Bible isn't just full of stories of promises made and promises delivered in the way they thought, like we'll look at with Mary, the Israelites' journey is quite long and painful, and God is the promise-keeping God, so he always brings his promises to pass. But there's a lot of discouragement that can creep in along the way. Just a quick, a quick note personally about this. Um, I felt like years ago, uh, many of you know that I've wrestled with anxiety and so forth, and I felt like years ago God had spoken a word about bringing deliverance in that area and had given me some pictures around healed brains and all of that. Well, it, it, so many years had passed, and I had seen some small progress, but I hadn't seen a lot of the big fruit, and so quite frankly, I got discouraged. It, it wasn't as if I believed that God wasn't able. It's just I didn't really think he would. Or I just was afraid to hope because I didn't want to. I didn't want to have my my hopes dashed, right? So I'm I'm sitting with a group of women, and Marilyn is here. She, she said I could share this. Sitting with a group of women, and we're sharing prayer requests. And mine is often prayer for peace. If you've been in a group with me, you know that that's true. 
and and not because I'm trying to just say something easy, but because that's a real like felt need every week for God's peace, right? So so I share that. We pray for each other. We come back around the next week, and Marilyn says to me, Caitlin, I prayed for you for peace. Did you have peace all week? <laughs> and I wish that my response had. Regardless of whether I had or hadn't, I wish that my response had been um, full of faith, but it wasn't. I, I looked at Marilyn, and I think I said something polite, like, thank you. It was, you know, it was, it was fine. You know, it was somewhat of a struggle, but thank you. And, and, and this, is, this is this true confession, but in my heart I thought, man, what is Marilyn thinking? Like... I mean, I have prayed and fasted. I have done everything that you possibly can around this. And she thinks by praying a prayer for a week, it's just going to be gone like that, right? And the Holy Spirit convicted me. And I had to go back and apologize to Marilyn. Because, see, sometimes we're in a space where we get so discouraged, like the Israelites were, of waiting to see God bring his promises to pass, that we need friends like the paralytic did, to hold up, to, to bring us before Jesus and say, I, I'm believing on your behalf, right? Like you, you can't, it, it seems like an impossibility in your mind, but it's not for God's. And that God was so proud of you, Marilyn, that you had that heart of faith that hadn't been jaded by, by just waiting to see God's promises n- not met in the timeline that we had thought, that you would continue to believe in faith for me. And so it was a great encouragement. And I know somebody in the room has used the term impossibility bucket. And I think that was, I had to confess to the Lord, this is in my impossibility bucket of your promises. And I don't know how you're going to bring it to pass, but I pray that you would encourage my heart and you'd encourage my faith. And I want to get other sisters around who believe for me when I can't believe for myself, right? Because when, when we're journeying with God and we're journeying towards his promises, we're not always going to be strong every moment of the day. And, and as I read later on when Jesus is about to leave and he's about to, to die and he's, he has this long conversation as we see John 14 through John 16 with his disciples, And he says, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to guide you into all truth. The world's going to hate you. Your grief's going to turn to joy. He makes all these promises. He he, he tells them what's to happen, right? But he says, "I'm I'm doing this for a couple reasons. One, so that you may believe that when what comes to pass, that you may believe that I am he and that you won't be led astray and that in me you may have peace. Because this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Right? So so God is all about covenant relationship, lasting intimacy with his people. And, And you can't have that without promises, right? You can't have that without commitment. And so God is making these commitments, these covenants, that they may have security in lasting relationship with him, and they may know what's to come, that when it happens, it may grow their faith and they may not be blindsided by the struggles along the way. So the Israelites go on, and if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump to chapter 13. Lots of plagues, lots of God revealing himself to the people and to Pharaoh. And they're finally on their way, right? We got, we got out of the path of my feet are stuck in the ground in disbelief, and they're, they're on the move. And let's pick up in verse 17. So when Pharaoh let the people go, so now they're on the route, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, If they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Okay, is anyone else uncomfortable with this verse? 
he, he didn't lead them by the straight path, right? The straight path to go to the promised land would have probably been about 200 miles to get to from Egypt to the promised land. That could have taken like 14 days. I mean, there's 2.4 million, 2 to 3 million people. That's a lot of people to trek across, you know, 200 miles. But God specifically doesn't take the short route. And yet his promise hasn't changed to them. When God lets the people go, he didn't lead them on the short route because he said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So he takes them through the desert. Does anyone else feel like that sometimes when God makes his promises and then you're like in the desert and you're like, hey, wait, did I hear it wrong from you, God? Is your promise no longer good? Is, you know, what's going on? And, uh, and so the answer is God, God, of course, was totally like hadn't lost his mind. This was actually the most gracious thing that God could have done because he's like, if they encounter these enemies here, they're going to turn back and it's going to be over. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So he promises his presence. He promises to go ahead of them as they're on their journey of promise, but not to lead them straight through. I think about how easy it would have been, and we see this actually happen with the Israelites, for all the grumbling to take place. Like, maybe God is no longer for you. Because he knows how hard this route is going to be. So, you know, and, and, and it's almost like you can hear Satan, you can hear the enemy whispering, like, is God really good? You know, like, did, is he just trying to jerk you around to tell you something hopeful? He leads you out and now to just have you take the long way. But as we know, my friends, that God if there was a shortcut that was going to be good for us, God would have us walk through it. But there's no shortcuts often to the maturation process of what God wants to do in our lives. Right? Because he knew that their ultimate end would be worse if they faced war and turned back than if they faced trial after trial and trial, and they saw God show up time and again through manna, through quail, through provision from water coming out of a rock, right? All these miracles that by the time they would get to the promised land, they would know more about who God was and who he, who he was for them than if they had just taken the short route. I got to thinking about how sometimes it seems like it's easy to say that God's delays are God's discipline or God's disapproval or just because of our disobedience. When actually, I think, often God's delays are by design. They're for our development. There's something specific that he's working in and through us that show us his heart and his character that we would have missed had we just taken the shortcut. And so it's so important to know this and to know God's word around this so that the enemy doesn't come in and, and tell us lies of shame if you had more faith, it would have been more direct. It would have been faster. It would have been easier. He would have taken you by streams, luscious streams. Not only did he take you through, not only did he not take you through the direct route, but he took you through the desert. I mean, right? But to say no, like when Pastor Dave preached on Lazarus in the resurrection, there was a delay. That was by design. Right? And if you didn't hear that message, go back and listen to it. But it was by design because God had a purpose that he wanted to fulfill, not just in Lazarus' life, but in the witness of revealing who he was to everybody around him that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. So rather than saying, God, what are you punishing me around? God, what, are you, what might you be preparing me for that you're not having me go the most direct route right now? But about a month after Egypt, they're still in that spot, unfortunately, where they're wishing they had died. They have grown weary and lose, lost heart. And they've, they say, if only we had died by the Lord's hands in Egypt. 
There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve this assembly to death. So that's chapter 16, verse 3, a couple chapters later. So it's almost as if without keeping God's promises in front of them, they're satisfied to live life without God, without his presence, and without his promise. Does that make sense? So if all, if all we see is the natural and what's in front of us and discouragement, then we become, it's so easy to just become satisfied with life apart from what God has said he's going to do. And it doesn't just have to be like really huge things in our lives like family or health or things like that. It can be God's promises that he's given us in his word around never leaving us or forsaking us, around working all things together for good, around him delighting in us, rejoicing over us. God's gracious and they keep journeying on and we get to Exodus 23 A little more of their story here. And this is actually the same same kind of retelling as the Deuteronomy passage that Grant read for us, um, two two accounts of this story. Um, But they're they're at Mount Sinai, and they've gotten the promises of God. They have the Ten Commandments. And then God says something really, really interesting. Basically, like, I'm going, uh, Exodus 23, verse uh, 27 that he's going to go ahead of them, send terror ahead of them. And then in verse 29 about their enemies in the promised land, I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become too desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I'll drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Oh my goodness. I mean, isn't this crazy? I don't know how many times you guys have read this before, but when I read this in Deuteronomy, I was like, this is mind-blowing. God is saying, I've made a promise. I have the land for you, but I'm not going to destroy your enemies all at once. I'm not going to do it in a single year. I'm going to do it little by little. It's the same thing that Grant read, except it doesn't say a year. It says little by little. Why? Because the wild animals will become too numerous. This isn't like... um, hyperbolic language. Literally, I mean, one commentator that I read was talking about how, you know, when you go in to possess a land and there's a lot of killing, there's a lot of dead bodies, literally the wild animals could come and overtake the land, right? Unless there is, you know, you're taking it piece by piece and you can kind of contain the wild animals from from overtaking the, the human beings at this point. I mean, like the graciousness of God Right? That he, that he says, I've promised something, but I'm not going to do it all at once because it's actually going to be best for you that I do this, that I bring you the promise little by little. That is so encouraging to me in areas where I'm still waiting on God. Right? That little by little is part of God's design. And part of God's grace, and I think about in my own life, if God immediately, God can do anything he wants, right? He can snap his finger, speak a word, and I mean, he spoke words, and all all creation came into existence. And in the area of anxiety, he could speak a word, it'd be done forever, you know? And, And maybe he will, and he's spoken additional words recently around deliverance that I believe he's going to bring to pass. However, I wonder if God immediately delivered us and brought his fullness of promise immediately to everything, if we wouldn't have the tools developed along the way to be able to sustain that change and some of the healing. You know that there are things that we learn and process of of wrestling with the Lord, of bringing things before him that not only help for our freedom, but help others break free down the road too that the most gracious thing that God could do in our lives may not be the quickest miracle answer prayer of whatever we're asking him around, but a process that he's working out in us. Um, I get up often to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. It's no surprise. (laughs) Poor Terry, I don't know how he sleeps. But, um, But... 
I've been struck almost every time I get up, it seems like Katerina's growing. I just feel like she's pushing out. And I don't know if it happens more at night or in the day, but I notice this at night. And I was thinking last night, you know, it, um, I was like, wow, it's like the growth happens so small that like I can't look at myself and say, you know, from one night to the next, she's grown. But I can feel that something's happening. But it's like the, the miracle happens a little piece at a time. Right? And I think that's some, sometimes the way it is with God, where it's like you don't know in the process how he's healing and setting you free or whatever the situation may be, you know, around health or marriage or family or, you know, whatever. But then you look back and you're like, I'm not where I was. I'm not, I'm not the same person that I was. I'm not in the same situation that I was because God has been fulfilling his promise to me little by little. Not because he's not good, but be, but because he has something that he's working out in the process. So you wish, the last part of their story is you wish that now they're on the door, the Israelites continue on, they're on the doorstep of the promised land. God has already said, hey, these nations are too large and strong for you, I'm going to do this by process. But the spies go in, and all they see is through the natural eyes. They don't see through the eyes of promise. So ten come back. And only Caleb and Joshua, right, give a good report. And, the, and, and everybody else just gets so discouraged because they're listening through the lack of faith to what, and, and not keeping in front of them what God's already said he'll do. And so almost all of them say, um, basically, it's over, right? They say in Exodus, um, well, they say... Uh, that basically we wish we had died. In Numbers 14 is when the people rebel, but basically we wish we had died. It would have been better our bodies, for our bodies to fall and our carcasses to be there. It's pretty sad. Numbers 14, verse 3, Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. They're, they're speaking something really negative over themselves too. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said, we should choose a lead, leader and go back. Like, they've just walked with Moses a long ways, and they're like, feet planted, I'm done, right? This is, this is, this is no longer happening. And, and God says, okay, like, my promise still stands, but basically if you're not willing to walk forward with me, I'm going to give it to your children and to those who have who are willing to move forward in faith. They get to the foots, they get on the doorstep of the promise and don't enter in. This is an upsetting passage. And um, Matthew Henry, one of the commentators, says, disbelief of the promise forbids the benefit. Those who despise the pleasant land should be shut out of it. The promise of God should be fulfilled to their children. They wish to die in the wilderness. God made their sin their ruin, took them at their word, and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. This isn't to create fear like we've got to get it all right all along the way. And God invites us to move forward in faith, right, with whatever he speaks. And his grace does abound. In my own life, I want the promises God makes to be fulfilled, to grow in maturity alongside faith. Because when God brings us into the fullness of what he wants to do, I, I want to operate in that faith. And if I, if I can't in that moment to call up Marilyn and say, hey, would you remind me what you prayed? You know, would you remind me what you prayed? Because every stage of what God is doing in the process is so important. Um, for time's sake, we won't get into all the, all the stages of pregnancy and what happens each week in every trimester, but you'll know if you've walked with any woman who's been pregnant before, that shortcutting the process is actually not good, right? That even though a baby could be born um, at 24 weeks now and even earlier, 21 in some days is what I've heard most recently, um, and live, uh, there's reasons why God has set out, ideally, you know, 39 to 40 weeks because that those last weeks the lungs continue forming and the vision keeps developing and and so you want you want we want to get to the point of being fully mature um, with the promises God has made that we continue to move forward 
with him in faith. Are you guys good for a few more minutes? Okay. Is it hot in here, or is this just... <sighs> I run colds the rest of my life, and uh, this is like pregnancy hot flashes are a real thing. Okay, so, so here we see an example of the Israelites um, uh, not doing it so hot, right? There were a few, though. It says that if you're in a group that's not moving forward in faith, you can still move forward in faith. I think that's what's so encouraging about the story of Caleb and Joshua, right? They, they believed God, they saw through the eyes of promise, and they kept moving forward. And then um, fast forward to Mary. You know, she's about Janice's age when the angel Gabriel comes and visits her and says, you're going to be with child. And if you have your Bibles, let's look at Luke together. The angel says to her in verse 30, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You'll be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. I love this part. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is said to have a child in her own age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you've said. Right? So she has this. Res- she gets this promise, and she has this response of faith. And the angel's so kind to say, hey, heads up. I just did the impossible with somebody else. And so what does Mary do? She runs, and she gets proximate to somebody who God has just fulfilled the promise to. Right? She goes immediately in verse 39. Uh, at that time, Mary got ready. She hurried to a town of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and she greeted Elizabeth. Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting. Um, John the Baptist, who's in her womb, leaps. Elizabeth's filled with the Holy Spirit and in a loud voice, she's like, how am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Right? So, So Elizabeth acknowledges the word that God had already spoken to Mary. Now Mary had every reason to run away from God, because she's at risk for stoning, honestly, at this point, right? But instead, rather than running from the promises of God, she runs straight to somebody who God has just fulfilled a similar promise to. I think there's something important about that, right? Because when when we feel like there's been a long delay of God fulfilling a promise that he's spoken to us, find somebody and go get proximate to them who has just witnessed the impossible in their life in a similar area. It may not be apples to apples, right? Like in preparation for this, I was trying to do some some of my own research. Who has God set free from OCD? I want a testimony, you know? And I'm struggling to find them. But but still, there's there's folks that have witnessed God doing the impossible in the area, in some area that's somewhat related, I bet, in each of our lives. And so to get proximate and say, I don't see it right now, but rather than dwelling in a stuck place, I'm going to go hang out with somebody who God has fulfilled the promise to, that's really hopeful, right? That's really hopeful because Mary believes God. Abraham believed God, right? It's credited to him as righteousness. Um, When we were back over Christmas, which is when this story is usually read, uh, the pastor there had a had a little text chain on the screen going on between Mary and her mom. You know, an imagine, imaginative one. Mary's mom says to Mary, hey, you know, how did the trip go to Bethlehem? Oh, mom, it was, you know, good. It was long. You know, there was no room for us, you know, in the inn, so we ended up with the animals, etc. You know, classic stuff. I think I'm 24, 24 weeks pregnant listening to this. And... Uh, And then Mary's mom says, well, Mary, was it a boy or a girl? And Mary says, mom, 
Of course it was a boy. I told you it would be. I just lost it. I'm, I'm weeping like crazy because it was like Mary had such faith that what God had said to her would be accomplished. Right? God had said specifically, you're going to have a boy. And she had said, okay, Lord, I'm ready. My, my womb is a ready place for you. My life is a ready place for you. And so her mom was a little skeptical, right? She's a little like, ah, okay, I see you're pregnant now, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's going to be a boy or a girl. But Mary knew. She had heard the voice of God. And, and she moved forward in that faith. So as we wrap up, when we find ourselves pregnant with promise and whatever it may be, who do we hang out with, right? Who do we listen to? Which voices are we listening to? Are we, as somebody said, are we rehearsing God's promises or are we just nursing the things that we're most afraid of? David says in Psalm 119, 41, May your unfailing love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. I think it's okay for us to remind God what he's promised. It's not that he forgot, right? But we're his kids and to have that dialogue with him. If you've heard of the devotional streams in the desert, the author of that said, tarry at the promise till God meets you there. He always returns by way of his promises. I think it's helpful to ask God, what trimester am I in in terms of this promise that you've given me? Or if you're a guy or a woman and that language doesn't resonate, what season am I in, right? Ecclesiastes, there's a time and a season for everything. What season am I in? Would you give me some insight, God, so that I might know? That is this a planting season, a sowing, a reaping season? Am I one week into this or am I 39 weeks? Maybe, maybe he'll tell us and may, if we need to know, he will. And if not, maybe he won't. But to just, because it's easy to project, our, it's easy for me to project a current disappointment onto the foreverness of God's promises. When it may just be you're in a, you're in a certain div- season around that where we're still waiting to see it come to pass. We started a little bit with Abraham's story and Sarah, right? And Romans 4, 18 to 22 recounts against all hope, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, He faced the fact, I love that, he's like looking at the real truth of the hopelessness, that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans 8, hope that's seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But we know what God has promised us around his spirit and the things, and we wait for it with patience, right? Whatever you came in with this morning, I believe that God wants to birth in us hope. And that steadfast spirit, that we live in a world that's so full of broken promises, And it's hard to try to pin our hope to things that seem like they're constantly changing and constantly out of reach. And God, though, is a promise-keeping God. Whatever he says, he will bring to pass. It may look a little different than we originally imagined since we see dimly, but he's going to be faithful to bring to pass the things that he has promised and put in our life. And so... Whatever we're pregnant with promise with, as Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold resolutely to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Right? Our faith at large, and I believe in the, in, in the big and small things, we know that God is faithful. Amen?
Amen.